So uh, over to you, Paloma. On behalf of the Center Director Section of the Latin American Studies Association, LASA, I'm delighted to open this event, which is part of our section's monthly series on indigeneity, Afro-descendants, and other marginalized populations in Latin America. The series encourages transcontinental collaborations, especially between the Global South and North, and it seeks to feature scholars, activists, experts, and others from groups historically marginalized in Latin America. We are delighted with the response of many centers of Latin American studies that have volunteered to organize these talks. In fact, we have so many proposals that we may extend this series until next academic year. Today, we thank our host, Dr. Stephen Wilkinson, director of the International Institute for the Study of Cuba at the University of Buckingham, and Dr. Marta Caminero Santangelo, former director of the University of Kansas Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Both centers have partnered to organize the panel, the African Descent and Contribution to Cuban Independence. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. It's a it's a real pleasure for me to uh, to open this this session, um, this roundtable. Um, the idea was um, uh, originated from some work that I've been doing on early nineteenth century Cuban history. Um, uh, it's commonly understood that the exceptional raceless Cuban national identity is rooted in the nineteenth century wars of independence, where the struggle for abolition and the struggle for independence were combined, which put African descended and European descended Cubans together in a common fight for liberty, both from enslavement and colonial control. So the idea for this round table is to bring together scholars uh, of the period, and we have three, and Marta will introduce them after I've uh, introduced the topic, to discuss ways in which the 19th century Cubans of African descent possibly reimagined Cuban national identity and independence. Um, attending, we will also attend to the experiences of women and the panel will explore how African descended slaves and free blacks rebelled prior to the work, first war of independence and then later afterwards in the two wars of independence that followed. And we will be asking whether it can be argued that a vision of a future raceless society might have been an aim of these insurrectionists, possibly inspired by the Asian Revolution at the start of the century. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Stephen. And I do want to thank Stephen, who did really all of the heavy lifting on this panel, all, absolutely all the organizing. So um, this uh, roundtable is, is due entirely to his efforts. Um, I'm going to just give a quick introduction on our three panelists um, up front. Um, and then each panelist will talk from anywhere from five to 10 minutes, um, just in terms of introductory remarks to give us some food for thought. Um, and then we will open it up to a larger discussion. Stephen and I um, might ask some questions just to get the discussion going, um, but I think we envision it as hopefully um, a broad and um, relatively informal conversation. So our first panelist is Aisha Finch, who is an Associate Professor of African American Studies and Gender Studies at UCLA. And if I'm correct, currently uh, Vice Chair in the Department of Gender Studies, is that right, Aisha? Um, she received her PhD in history from NYU. Her areas of research and teaching include comparative slavery, political and intellectual movements in Cuba, Latin America, and the African diaspora, gender ideologies in the Caribbean, and Black feminist thought. She's the author of Rethinking Slave Rebellion in Cuba, La Escalera and the Insurgencies of 1841 to 1844, and her current book manuscript, uh, Rethinking Slave Rebellion, uh, no, that's the same one, <laughs> Sorry, I should have read this more carefully. Uh, the book explores the resistance movements and political cultures of enslaved rural Cubans during the mid 19th century. And then uh, our second panelist is Bonnie Lucero, who is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Center for Latino Studies at the University of Houston Downtown 
campus. She earned her PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research centers on the historical intersections of race and gender in colonial and post-colonial contexts, especially in Cuba. She's the author of Revolutionary Masculinity and Racial Inequality, Gendering War and Politics in Cuba, and A Cuban City Segregated, Race and Urbanization in the 19th Century. She's also co-editor of Voices of Crime, Constructing and Contesting Social Control in Modern Latin America. Uh, her current project, tentatively titled Malthusian Practices, A History of Pregnancy, Abortion, and Infanticide in Cuba Since Colonial Times, interrogates how laws regulating women's reproduction historically perpetuated gender-specific forms of racial inequality since the 18th century. And then our third panelist, Cecile Axelien, is professor and chair of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. And prior to her current role, Cecile was director uh, at the University of Kansas of the Institute of Haitian Studies, as well as the associate director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Axelien's primary areas of interest include Haitian studies, gender studies, and film studies. She's the author of Rethinking Marriage in Francophone African and Caribbean Literatures, and she's also co-edited several collections, including Revolutionary Freedoms, A History of Survival, Strength, and Imagination in Haiti, Just Below South, Intercultural Performance in the Caribbean and the U.S. South, and Teaching Haiti Beyond Literature, Intersectionalities of History, Literature, and Culture. And her current book project is Haitian Hollywood, Recreating Home in Exile. So um, we will just go um, in the order in which I just introduced the panelists, starting with Aisha. Okay, um, so good afternoon to everyone. Um, good evening for some folks. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Stephen for convening us. I'm actually um, currently in the Department of Women's Studies at Emory University. Um, and so I'll just kind of um, give a few opening thoughts to sort of keep some time here um, to, uh, by way of um, sort of opening up the conversation. And one of the places that I think is uh, always just so generative to begin is with Ada Ferrer's now classic book, Insurgent Cuba, right? Um, and so, you know, Ferrer really has this emphasis on the idea of, of struggle, right? Struggle and um, and sort of like contradictions and inconsistencies and conflicts, right? As the site of nation making, right? Um, and she has this, this part in, the, in her introduction where she talks about it was, where she says it was conflict, not consensus that defined Cuba's 19th century revolution, right? Um, and thinking about sort of all of these, um, you know, uh, regional and class and racial divisions, right? Not as sort of deviations from an otherwise straight back path, but she says as constitutive of the national project, nationalist project itself. So that um, is kind of really generative for me, thinking about human independence kind of not as a, as a coherent and already knowable category necessarily, but rather as this kind of deeply contested process whose origin stories we also, you know, have to have to contest. Um, and that so that um, for me opens up um, some really productive ways to think about kind of the multiple trajectories and pathways to independence, some of which were rendered invisible or later disavowed, right? And I'm particularly interested in thinking about the relationship between the project of independence and the insurgent movements organized by enslaved people during the 19th century. Um, so kind of building from this premise of Cuban nationhood as a site of struggle, I would argue that there's kind of two ways to think about this relationship um, between um, sort of broadly speaking, slave rebellion and Cuban nationhood, which are both um, contradictory and convergent. So first, um, I mean, it, it is, it's absolutely critical to situate slave insurgencies, right, as central to the emergence of an anti-colonial movement in Cuba, and even more specifically to the development of the decolonial epistemologies that shape the Cuban nation and really grounding the story of Cuban nationalism within particular communities of African descent um, really shifts the ways in which we think about the temporality of anti-colonialism, 
right? And Fanny Rushing is one of the people who's argued for kind of thinking about this long durée approach to thinking through the emergence of the Cuban nation and really highlighting the ways in which enslaved and free people of color offered continuous, right? Vocal, vociferous, organized critiques of Spanish colonialism and its imbrication with slavery for well over a century prior to the opening of formal independence in 1868. So this kind of characterization of Cuba as kind of la siempre fiel isla, right, or the ever faithful isle, really requires us to question, right, faithfulness from whom? And it requires us to think about a Black radical tradition that fundamentally ruptured modernity as we know it, and really pushed a discourse of racelessness farther than it ever intended to go. And the ways in which you know, thousands of enslaved and formerly enslaved black people took that radical tradition with them onto the battlefields during 30 years of war. And some of that vision eventually manifested in the new Republic, but much, much of it did not, right? So at the same time, I also wanna think about really the kind of the limits of thinking about slave insurgency as part of a, large, a longer trajectory of national independence, right? Or what's, what, what's the dilemma in thinking about that trajectory? Because to think about slave rebellions as kind of rehearsals for independence really misses some of the profound and radical possibilities that were contained within organized slave insurgencies, right? So these were moments that were defined, often defined by violence and militarized aggression, um, right, that should not be romanticized. But these were also moments that were defined by a radical vision about Black life, Black futurity, Black sovereignty that could not be really kind of contained or cannot be contained by the teleology of the nation or the fight for independence, right? Um, and so really thinking about, so for example, I've written a lot about the 1843 rebellions in Western Cuba, right? Um, so the unraveling of white racial power in those moments constituted not only a profound rupture with the ethos of racialized captivity, but also a refusal of any existing scripts of rebellion, right? Including those created by insurgent leaders. So just really wanting to, um, you know, when we think about the 1843 rebellions, we think about these sustained practices of fugitivity, right? The, 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 the blanques that were kind of the constant plague of the plantation world. Um, you know, these practices represented black flight from the death world of the plantations flight from their gendered and sexual mandates, right? Um, Bianca Bushman talks about this in her forthcoming work, flight from a world organized around white coloniality and racial capitalism. Um, and as part of a larger kind of spectrum of organized slave opposition, these traditions carry a range of practices that are invariably, that are invariably rendered invisible, if not outright criminalized within Western nation states. Right, African Cuban spiritual practices, right, that eventually coalesced into Palamonte and Lukumi traditions, practices of care and intimacy, right, that constituted radical forms of kinship when traditional notions of family were made impossible, um, the range of African political traditions that effectively turned slaves into kings and queens, right, and it, as part of sort of the political architecture of these movements, right, in the midst of the plantation. These were kind of the aspects of Black Cuban sociality that were integral to slave rebellions and, and marinage, and that really orient us to a concern raised by the brilliant um, and late political theorist Richard Eiten, who really questioned whether the nation state as a political formation can sustain Black aspirations for and conceptions of freedom. You know, and his skepticism was really echoed by the literary theorist Sybil Fisher, right, who writes, you know, in her, her um, book, Modernity Disavowed, you know, she says, has this wonderful quote where she says, what might have been lost when the culture and emancip emancipatory politics of radical anti-slavery were finally forced into the mold of the nation state. So both of these questions kind of require us to sit with the radical cultures of black resistance and refusal that were illegible to a nation state based on Western modes of citizenship. So I'll just sort of um, end there by saying, I would like to think about these, these questions um, as we kind of engage these possibilities together, right? So attending to the ways in which slave insurgencies should absolutely um, kind of reconstitute the genealogy of Cuban nationhood in part by the alternative futures that they represented, but also attending to the fact that slave insurgencies represented something that could not be captured by the political ideologies of the Cuban nation, right? And really therefore constitute moments that exceed the grammar, right? Of nation, nationality, nationality, independence, and so forth, right? And so, 
one way to think through kind of a more productive coexistence maybe of these seemingly antagonistic frameworks is to think about slave rebellions as central and indeed integral to anti-colonialism and decolonial thinking, but as having kind of a more perhaps uneasy um, relationship to independence and, and the nation state, right? And as part of that, really also questioning the underlying tropes um, of, of resistance and revolution and freedom that remain unquestioned when we consider these frameworks through a lens that privileges militarism, right? And masculinity and belligerence um, and what sort of gets disallowed when we privilege those frameworks. So I'll, um, I'll stop there because um, I want to create space for other folks to give comments. Thanks. Thank you, Alicia. Um, that was really, I'm, I'm so glad. Bonnie, you're mute. It says it's, that I'm muted. No, we no, can even. Now I, now yeah. I hear you. Okay. All right, so I'm good now? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Aisha. I'm so glad you started with um, pointing to Ara Perez's book um, because that's an excellent starting point. And for me, I'm gonna actually go the other way chronologically. Um, so I'm gonna go towards the Republic when I talk about kind of how conflict rather than consensus as you um, put it, um, really defined the struggle for independence. And in, in my work, really what has been pivotal to answering that question is really centering um, gender, I, I, gendered ideas and gendered ideologies. And so in my first monograph, Revolutionary Masculinity and Racial Inequality, I really, um, I think about how racial exclusion persisted despite nationalist discourses of racial harmony, um, specifically through these gendered ideologies, specifically masculinity. And many people might be wondering, after so many decades of studying Cuban independence through a masculine militarized lens, why would we study specifically masculinity? And for me, it's it's really important to think about men as gendered subjects in their own right, really prior to, um, you know, in previous scholarship, um, men were kind of taken for granted as this universal subject. It was a... a a um, an independent struggle that was really centered around what men were doing without even asking if men's experience was representative or whether it kind of reflected other people's experience. And it really wasn't until Teresa Prados Torreira's book, Mambisas, that we really started to actually think about what, I mean, are there other people um, involved in in these um, in this anti-colonial struggle, and she makes a really great case that women were really central to that struggle in a lot of different ways, right? And so I'm I'm kind of um, dialoguing with, with both those ideas by saying, okay, we need to think about men as gendered subjects, and by doing that, we really see kind of how Cubans of different backgrounds are attempting to negotiate and resolve the conflicts in perceptions and ideas over what independence will look like. So in my book, I take um, kind of a case study of central Cuba. Um, I'm looking specifically at the fourth army corps of the, the independence, the liberating army, which is a really interesting case study because a lot of the people that fought in the fourth corps eventually become um, really pivotal to national politics in the three, four decades after the war ends. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of look at the backgrounds that they're coming from. And basically what I'm seeing there is that you have kind of a shifting and evolving kind of amorphous vision of masculinity that's being used and redefined at specific historical moments specifically to adjudicate these conflicts over who's going to have the right to authority, who is going to be representative of the nation, who's going to have access to power, who's going to have access to authority. And so with that, um, it, um, the book kind of goes not only into the, the, um, the years of the war, but also into the, um, the years of the military, the U.S. military occupation and asking how 
does this um, political transition, this really contentious, fraught political transition, how does that again um, push and pull and, and change these ideas of masculinity so that um, it ultimately they're the dominant visions of masculinity are supporting the persistence of racial hierarchy as opposed to the challenges against it, which were really um, pivotal to the early imaginings of the Cuban anti-colonial struggle. Um, so I really think that, um, you know, this the conflict over defining um, anti-colonial struggle and defining what's going to come after that, um, gender, uh, you know, uh, centering gender really helps us understand how um, Cuban men and women of different backgrounds are thinking about this and how they're negotiating it on the ground in their everyday lives, in their, um, in, on the battlefield, it, during meals, during, I mean, these just these very everyday experiences. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to be in this panel. Hey. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Bonsoir, good evening, um, good afternoon. <laughs> um, I have to say it's intimidating to be among historians. I am not a historian. I would blame Marta for um, whatever faux pas I make. Um, I am a literary and cultural studies scholar, and as such, I'm entering the discussion from the perspective of cultural production. And what I will do is briefly discuss uh, La Ultima Cena, The Last Supper. Um, I know many of you are familiar with it, but I don't want to assume, so I will just briefly contextualize and put my thoughts together. And I will end with a two and 45, two minutes and 45 seconds um, music by the, um, the Creole Choir of Cuba. So, um, so the Last Supper uh, by Thomas Gutierrez Alea uh, is set just after the Haitian Revolution uh, at the end of the 18th century in a sugar mill in Havana, Cuba. As we can imagine, Cuban enslavers, they are panicking and they're scared um, of what that Haitian Revolution means for them. So at the beginning of the film, we see the count to return to find out that Sebastian, one of his enslaved, um, uh, had run away. And the overseer, Don Manuel, cut off Sebastian's ears and feed it to the dogs to teach the other enslaved people a lesson on obedience. And what's interesting for me is um, the way you have this tension. Um, the count really sees himself as a good peer's Christian, even though um, the priest on the plantation is uh, um, constantly telling him he needs to be a better Christian, including by um, letting the enslaved go to mass uh, so that they can learn about God, because of course um, they don't know God because uh, they are, that's one of the reasons they are enslaved. Uh, because they are dark skin and all that. So, uh, as you can imagine uh, from the title itself, The Last Supper, um, the Count is reenacting The Last Supper, and he claims to see the 12 chosen, quote-unquote, um, enslavers as the 12 disciples. And he even went as far as um, doing mass to kiss their feet. But, of course... Watching the film, we see that after he does that, he wipes off his mouth. Um, he's drunk and he is uh, supposedly teaching uh, the enslaved about Christian virtues such as the quote-unquote joy of suffering. But he is being challenged. In fact, one of, one of the enslaved said, let me see if I understand. When overseer beats me, I shall be happy. You know, that's the translation. So while drunk, the count promised the enslaved that they will not work on Good Friday. They'll have the day off. And when he 
fails to keep his promises, they revolt. So this revolt on Good Friday can be read as representing the revolt of the enslaved and saint um, We see the tension and hypocrisy about religion. When the slave, of course, rebel, um, even though at this time there are um, laws about um, ensuring that the enslaved are giving a fair trial, none of that ha happened. Rather, it's demonstrated to others what their fate will be when they um, disobey their masters. And we can talk more in the Q&A, but for me, the film is an important document to demonstrate the ways in which Haitian revolutionary ideals impacted Cuban society. Um, for instance, the plantation sugar manager, Don Gaspar, he just survived from Saint-Domingue, and he's there, he's teaching techniques about how to grow um, how to go um, uh, sugar in a way that's really profitable. But at the same time, he is quite worried that um, because um, the slave um, owner, the um, enslaver, they want to get more, um, more enslaved people so that they can grow more, more sugar. But Don Gaspar is worried because he knows what happened in Saint Domingue and he's thinking, if we get to a point where there are more enslaved people than whites, this is what will happen. So you have those two tensions. On the one end, you know, profit versus what can actually happen if there are um, more enslaved people than whites. But on, on the other end, um, with the count, you have the tension of, um, uh, you know, his rapport with the priest because what he's doing, of course, is um, raping women and making the slave, the enslaved work constantly because um, he cares more about profit than saving um, their souls. So um, uh, historian Alisa Goldstein Sepinwal just came out with a book called um, uh, Slave Revolt on Screen. I don't know if you can see the Haitian Revolution in film and video. And um, it's a really interesting book. And what she does is, as it comes to The Last Supper, she talks about, she argues, in fact, that um, while The Last Supper is about Cuban um, slavery, but it is much more about um, a warning of the Haitian Revolution and not an inspiration. And we can talk about that um, more. Um, so for me, using the reality of slavery, of um, um, the film does a good job of, I think, also connecting to Cuban society uh, various issues that we're dealing with, um, including colorism and Afro Afrocentric religion, issues that are very relevant um, at the time. Uh, I think in the Cuban imaginary, it was important to distance um, its struggles and independence from Haiti as a Black nation because Haiti unapologetically rejected the notion that whites were superior. And as we all know, Jose Marti's idea of Cuban nationalism as celebrating the country's diverse heritage um, was in many ways problematic. Later on, I would like to come to the 20th century because that's really the areas that I know more um, to connect um, Haiti to Cuba. And I would like to talk uh, about some of the ways in which um, Haitians were treated um, in Cuban sugar mills in the, uh, in the early part of the 20th um, century. But um, I do want to end with the ways in which Cuba and Cuban culture um, and Haiti are connected to the Cuban group, the Creole Choir of Cuba. So the Creole Choir of Cuba is a very, um, interesting group in that what they do is they celebrate their Haitian roots. Uh, you will hear them sing in Creole. The songs are passed down from their family since the 19th century. And um, so they really, uh, in their different type, the different type of songs they sing, you have some um, songs, some of, that are voodoo songs, and you have um, more and more. Um, after 1996, they went, they went and visited Haiti, and they started adding some contemporary aspect of Haitian culture 
in their music. So I'll let um, Stephen play about two or three music. One, um, Marasailu and Aitsi Pukisawa Pukie. And this should be about um, three minutes. Thank you. Okay, everyone should be able to see that, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, she, yeah, was, and, was, and that in, yes. was that in Creole? That la the language was it? Was it? Yes, yes, it was in Haitian Creole. In Marasai Lu, I put on the chat um, in Haitian Voodoo, the Marasa or the Divine Twins, and although they are um, children, they are some of the oldest Lua or spirits. So it's very powerful that they have. Uh, maintain um, this was a way to maintain in the in a very proud way uh, the connection between um, between Cuba Cuba and Haiti and the Creole choir of Cuba the two and the US and all over the world. So could I just ask, just out of interest, that that music as is is something that was brought to Cuba. Uh, when the Haitians were brought to Cuba uh, in the early 19th century and has remained there? Or has it been curated and excavated by the Cubans today? Is it, is it, is it a, is it a legacy? So it, it, it was brought to Cuba and through generation they have passed on, like these songs. Yes. That is, so, that is so interesting and so fascinating and it's, it, it's it's really it, it really connects like you say the the 20th century with the early 19th century that's so important i think okay well this has been great so far marta did you want to uh ask a question or did you want to uh say anything um uh, I have a question maybe to get the discussion started. The pan thank you so much, all three of you. Those are incredibly rich um, 
introductory remarks and um, really had me thinking a lot about this question of, okay, um, nation state and how the nation defines itself in relation to um, both questions of race and racelessness and these and the early slave rebellions and their links to um, to uh, notions of national independence. I don't know. I'm hearing a strong buzzing from somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, if, if, uh, if people in the chat in the in the call could mute their microphones, it it would probably yeah. Okay. Thank you. Whatever happened, that helped. Thank you. Um, so what I was thinking about, first of all, was this opening question of the of um, slave rebellions as as kind of linked to um, independence movements, and um, and this is not my area at all. So I'm speaking as a as a real novice on some of these questions, but um, but certainly the linking of slave rebellions to independence movements. Um, to then historically this emergent um, notion of um, sort of a raceless cubanidad, which I think we all know is not, it's really problematic and, and not true, but, but there is this sort of national narrative um, today that Cuba is without, you know, not racist, um, which you will then get um, a lot of challenges to when you're actually talking to to. Um, certainly Cuban academics. Um, and then I was thinking about Cecile's comment about um, Cuba's distancing itself from the Haitian Revolution um, precisely because um, there was sort of an unapologetic refusal of white um, superiority, uh, which, may, which had me thinking back to Aisha's comments about what gets lost or suppressed when um, I guess when black resistance or black rebellions are co-opted or absorbed into this kind of story, national story of racelessness as constitutive of the nation state. And then I was thinking about it in even in a broader Caribbean context, because obviously then on the other hand, we've got it. It seems on the face of it, like maybe the Dominican Republic went in the opposite direction. I think it's I'm this is a. Um, I want to problematize this, but um, certainly the Dominican Republic was distancing itself so dramatically from Haiti to the point that it was actually embracing um, a Spanish identity and a white identity. Um, and then, and in addition, I was thinking about questions of gender and um, I don't know, I was thinking about Jose Marti's assertion that Cubans are in fact masculine um, and therefore able to, you know, resist Anglo or should resist Anglo absorption um, in contrast to the this Anglo um, idea of an effeminized and raced uh, Cuban non-whiteness. And so I just wanted to play around with these ideas of national identity, um, Cubanidad, responses to the Haitian Revolution, um, and masculinity and gender in whatever ways the panelists would like to take that nexus of questions. Was that too unwieldy? How did the historian <laughs> think so? <laughs> Steve, we can't hear you. Sorry. What I'm very interested to hear is, and there's something you said, Aisha, right at the very beginning, is that uh, African descended people, enslaved people, rebelled for a century before 1868. Now, um, we're all, I mean, we're all agreed that this idea of a raceless Kubanidad actually is a kind of white dominant discourse which comes after 1868, and it's kind of formulated at the end of the 19th century by Marti in particular, who happens to be, yes, white male liberal. Now, uh, it seemed, what, 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 what interested me was, uh, the people that were rebelling before 1868 were black people, 
and they were enslaved. Some weren't, some were free blacks, but they, you know, the, the slaves, the, this was a struggle against slavery, but they must have imagined whatever kind of result that they, if they were successful, they would be creating a new society, a new entity to live under it. And that must therefore, ipso facto, be anti-racist. They couldn't imagine they wanted to enslave white people, right? So I, I would imagine that they themselves would wish to live in a society where all people, regardless of race, shared the same rights, as was tried to be established by the Haitians in Haiti. Um, you know, if you take the 1804 constitution of Haiti, it is pretty anti-racist in my view. So is it possible to kind of argue that the origin of raceless Cubanidad is actually a black imagining, which predated the 1868? What do you think? Well, I mean, I can, can sort of take a, a stab at this. So, what I think is important is to kind of parse out um, the the ways in which we understand racelessness, right? The ways that it was articulated by a particular kind of revolutionary elite, right? And a subsequent national elite, right? Um, and to sort of um, distinguish that from the ways in which um, enslaved people and free people of color, right, mounted this um, this kind of sustained critique of of, of racial slavery, right? Um, and so I think I mean there's a couple of things to think about, you know, with with the idea of um, of racelessness and you know so so on the one hand right nada talks about this in her book right that that it actually there it we have to actually think about the radical implications of this discourse right emerging when it did in the late 19th century at the height of a period of biological racism right the nadir of u.s postbellum race relations right um um and the ways in which racelessness has been since its inception a way to evade questions of, of race and racism, right? And that I think is really kind of the dual legacy of racelessness that we have to reckon with. Devin Spence Benson talks about this in her excellent examination of this discourse, right, in the post-1959 revolutionary state, right? Um, that it had this radical potential and the ways in which it became a vehicle right, for Black people to critique the failures of the nation to live up to that potential, right? Um, and on the other hand, forces us to question an idea of nationhood, the uh, question the idea of a Republican nationhood that was completely divorced, right, or somehow a radical departure from these earlier systems of racial violence and dispossession. And what I would say to, to answer your, your question really specifically, Stephen, um, what I think um, is that we can root very firmly in the um, in the the movements of enslaved and free people in the nineteenth century, right? Is a particular kind of um, a particular kind of thinking, a particular kind of articulation of anti-colonialism, right, and decoloniality that was rooted in the um the a, a i don't know that i would say racelessness but i would say absolutely a, a radical commitment to black political sovereignty right to black personhood and being right and um to all of the you know kind of ideological um apparatuses that um, were attendant to racial captivity and racial slavery. So um, I think that stating that they are no longer blacks nor whites, they're only Cubans, 
is in and of itself a particular kind of political project, right? That is intended to mobile, is intended as a form of mobilization, um, of political mobilization, right? That is intended to be a, um, a discourse that, that structures the nation and it does very specific political work. And I would say that the radical impulse of racelessness, right, which, um, which Black Republican activists, right, Melina Papadimos talks about this, right, um, Takara Brunson talks about this in her beautiful new work, right, um, then mobilized, right, was that impulse of um, Black and African subjects in the 19th century to outright refuse the terms, right, and the conditions um, of coloniality that then made racelessness um, necessary as a discourse, right? So does that make sense? That That's how I would kind of make um, that distinction, right? I think that we, and that's where I was sort of trying to go in my, in my opening remarks, which is that I think that it's really critical to, to understand the ways in which, I mean, I, you know, I think we can argue, right, that, um, that slave rebellions effectively radicalized, right, and pushed a particular kind of nationalist discourse in a direction where it might not have um, originally gone, right? Um, but I think that's a, that to me is a little bit different from, um, from situating um, enslaved insurgents as kind of the progenitors of of, of racelessness, right? Which I think of as having very particular political utility, right? And, and very particular um, political aims that are rooted in um, the nation state and the nation state form, right? Those are my thoughts. So what- Steve, we, we can't hear you. I think you're gonna- I'd also like to add on to that. So go ahead, Bonnie, go on, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to really agree with Aisha here. Um, I think I think the key question is, what is the political work that racelessness does, right? And Aisha, you 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 stated that question really well. And I think you know we have to ask, who needs racelessness? Who needs it? Black people don't need racelessness. White people need racelessness because what is the work that racelessness does? Racelessness essentially erases and eliminates and preempts the ability to talk about something that's uncomfortable for white people and it's for white people. And that essentially, and so I have to argue that I, I don't see, I don't see the, and I, I'm not an expert in that in that subject matter, but I don't see the slave and free people of color uprisings of the 19th century as, um, as claiming race. They're simply claiming humanity. They're saying, hey, I wanna be treated as a person. I want basic human rights. That's not racelessness. That's see me as a person for who I am. And it's, you know, we get racelessness when we have to figure out a way to bridge very clear and pristine realities of racial hierarchy with a joint and shared project of anti-colonialism. That's why we get racelessness. It's in fact, in many ways, I would argue that racelessness is not revolutionary as many people have argued, but actually very um, reactionary, very um, oppressive in a lot of ways, because you're essentially preempting any talk of what could be in terms of changes to the racial order. Cecile, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, for me, as I was thinking about this whole idea of um, um, racelessness, I can't help but think about the 20th and 21st century again, which is the area I know more. And there is this notion, again, by quote-unquote white Cubans, and especially we all know the, this has been used to benefit um, the majority of, especially predominantly white Cubans, quote-unquote, with that whiteness, to position themselves and be in power. Uh, and we see, you know, that tension with Haitian and Cubans in the U.S. And it's very interesting because. Um, we see it differently because 
Cuba and Haiti a different can't have a very different rapport than Cuban and Haitians in Miami, for instance. And so um, it's interesting, I think, this whole um, raceless society has benefited white and continues even going into the 20th um, century and what, and what it does. And it, and it makes sense for quote-unquote white Cuban as they came to the U.S. in the 20th century and so forth to, um, to position themselves that way. It's beneficial and to get certain advantages. So we have to look at the roots, the colonial roots that still exist today of that wasteless society. So that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I find this very interesting. I, I'm I, I I can see exactly what you're what you're saying, uh, both uh, Aisha and 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 Bonnie, and my my approach was to think about this uh, from the other side, if you see what I mean, that the people in Cuba who were white and wishing for independence, liberals, were split because there was a liberalism that was racialized. I mean, like the republic in the United States, it was a, a liberal white republic uh, and excluded blacks. Uh, and the, the, the situation in Cuba arose that this divided white uh, liberalism, um, you know, the, 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 those, that, those that wished for, uh, you know, um, a liberalism that, inc that, that included black rights were in a minority until after the American Civil War, until the latter part of the 19th century. And then you get white liberals who who begin to articulate uh, an inclusive narrative which would let black people in. But my view is that this is kind of like you're saying, forced upon them by the fact that the black people themselves were necessary for the project to be successful. They had to, they had to defeat the racist white liberals. And so they this 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 whole uh, ideology of racelessness originates um, at, because of a, a, a necessity a de, um, on the white part, but it's an absolute goal for the blacks. It has to be. I mean, when I say racelessness, not the the imposition of a kind of ideology which is re, which is repressive, as you've articulated. But a but a, a society that is without without racism. I wonder but if it's possible. I'm sorry, Bonnie. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I well, wanna... maybe it's possible that you and I were about to say roughly the same thing. But um... yeah, I'm just I just want to make the small point that um, discursive racelessness is not the same as a society without racism. And in fact, I, I was going to say something very similar. I was going to ask if it's possible to talk about national imaginaries that are anti-racist separately from a national imaginary or a national narrative of racelessness. And what might those national narratives, either historically or in terms of culture production, what, how, how could we think about national narratives or national imaginaries that are anti-racist? but not raceless. Aisha, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, I think it's really important also to think about the way, like racelessness as a particular kind of political strategy, right? Um, and one of the strategies, right, was to mark, right, a particular kind of departure from the colonial regime, right, in ways that actually masked and muted and um, rendered um, inarticulable, which is to sort of limit the, the possibilities for talking about the ways in which the nationalist movement, Cuban independence, and the new republic um, 
were in some ways, absolutely, and in other ways were not, right? Did not represent a departure from that colonial regime, right? But needed a rhetoric to, um, to make it clear to, you know, sort of a range of people who, sort, you know, they need to, to, to buy in, for lack of a better way of putting it, right? Um, sort of a, a particular kind of nationalist project. So, um, yeah, I think I think the the, the points that, that Bonnie was making about sort of like who exactly needs racelessness, right? And literally up until up until this contemporary moment, um, and the ways in which that has been um, invoked actually to um, to silence black dissidents, to um, as a sort of as a repressive mechanism to um, to eliminate. Um, kind of vocal critiques of um, racism and anti-Black violence, right? Um, that is really kind of the evolution of, of racelessness that I think we need to 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 keep central. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, it maybe draws attention to it a little bit more if we acknowledge that the raceless, um, national identity that emerges in the mid 19th century, you know, 1868 and onward, is not the first iteration of Cuban national identity. I mean, earlier 19th century nationalist projects were explicitly racist, explicitly anti-Black. I mean, if we look at, you know, the the 18 teens, for example, and Jose uh, Jose Antonio, uh, excuse me, Jose Antonio. Um, Paco, thank you, um, is talking about, you know, a Cuban national identity that is explicitly white. And to achieve that, we need to stop the slave trade. Like, we need to stop, we need to literally control the demographic uh, uh, trajectory of the island in order to produce this white population so that we can have a white national identity. And so many others agreed with this, maybe not by specifically ending the slave trade. That was a little bit controversial because many people benefited from that, of course. But um, this idea that whiteness was so key and so central to even the, the possibility of Cuba having a national identity. And we see that again, for example, in the colonization projects throughout the century that continue really all the way through the 19th century, even as we're talking about a raceless, raceless national identity, we're still literally paying people from Europe to please settle in Cuba so we can whiten the population. That's wild. I mean, think about that. That's, that's really not a raceless yeah. national identity at all. That's a specifically and explicitly white national identity. It's an idea that premises the existence of a national community on whiteness. And this kind of um, foundation really doesn't disappear with the emergence of raceless rhetoric, right? We still have the notion of the universal human slash male subject as implicitly white. It's not acknowledged, right? Jose Marti would, would deny it and he would say, oh no, we're not white, we're not black, we're not Mugato, we're not anything. But if you were to ask Cuban men of his day, what does a Cuban man look like? Yeah. Who would they imagine? They would imagine somebody who looks like Jose Martí, yeah. a white man. And so, into you, into your point, this, okay. So yeah, there's an echo, and I couldn't hear if you were talking. I apologize, Bonnie. Please go ahead, Cecilia. Okay. Yeah. No. So what I was Saying to your point, um, looking back um, at the Last Supper, there's this moment in which the Count say vehemently, this is not saint domain. You know, the idea like this will never happen. And interestingly, the runaway and slave person, Sebastian, um, he is shown as not having the virtue because he practices Afrocentric religion. He has not brought into you know, why um, Catholicism, and this, this is why, this is why he runs away, because he doesn't, ex he doesn't 
understand his place um, in regard to, to whiteness and his problematic, of course, yeah. I'm just wondering if I also there are... just wanted, oh, no, I just wanted to sort of add to, you know, this, um, this discussion with this list that Bonnie was making, right? Like Domingo del Monte, right? Francisco de Valle Gonzalez, right? Like this list, right? Of the, the fathers of the nation, right? So the early fathers of, of the nation, you know, in 1844, um, our 18, 1840s, I should, should say, you know, having discussions, right? About a, um, an independence movement and actively trying to figure out, right? Like sort of like actively discussing how to do this without black people, right? How to do this, uh, more to the point, how to do this while still maintaining slavery, um, how to do this while um, sort of um, attending to the, the fragility of white slaveholders, sort of the original white fragility, right? Um, and, you know, and actually stating things like, you know, we have to make sure that this does not turn into, you know, a black republic. Um, and so just wanted to kind of add, it, add to that point and to the kind of the deepening of this, um, I mean, and it's, it's, it's a tension, right? Because on the one hand, you have this idea that, um, that, um, you know, slavery and anti-colonialism have, you know, anti-slavery, I should say, maybe that was an interesting slip, but anti-slavery and anti-colonialism have long been yoked, right? Have long been interconnected, right? In, in Cuban nationalist thinking. Um, but it is possible for that to be the case, right? And to still have that version of anti-colonialism based on anti-blackness, right? Which then gives rise to, you know, the forms of racelessness that we've been talking about. And so to go to to go back to one of your original questions, Aisha, which is what do we lose? What is lost um, when we um, when moments of black resistance or refusal get co-opted, get absorbed into this national narrative? Um, and I wonder if we can extend those questions to the 20th and 21st centuries and to current Cuban cultural or cultural representation or political protest, what continues to be lost if um, what continues to be lost or repressed in these notions of um, Cuban racelessness? Does our cultural our cultural critic Sissy want to take that one? Yeah. Um, I, so I was thinking, for instance, even when we hear of representation, we don't take, and it's not just in Cuba, it's in other places in Latin America. We don't take about how Haiti provided financial and military assistance. So we lost that humanity of um exchanges between these different nations and how there was an aspect of wanting to support one another um, to the world for freedom. So we have that and as we all know, it has and continued to create and has real impact and ramifications in um, our current contemporary society. As I mentioned before, relationships between Cubans and the U.S. versus Cuban and Cuba and Haiti is very different. Um, after the earthquake, um, Cuba was the first country to have sent doctors, dispatched medical doctors to Haiti. We don't even hear about that in, in the U.S. And you, I know such thing because I listen to, you know, the non-U.S. Um, news. Most people don't know that there has been exchange where um, Cuba um, sent medical doctors um, to Haiti and and trained medical doctors over four hundred medical doctors 
every year and now more and more with film, the Institute of Film Studies. They are very interesting cultural exchange that we don't we don't think about. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah, the other the other question that occurs to me though is is this is that if you're talking about the the project, the the Cuban uh, national project, which is articulated in the later 20th century by the revolution, Fidel Castro's uh, etc. What you have though is, despite the let's say. Uh, oppressive nature of the raceless discourse. Um, the black and African descended Cubans support overwhelmingly the revolutionary project. Um, and so the question has to arise as to, you know, why they do if the raceless ideology is somehow an oppressive one. And, and my answer to that is, again, it goes back to what you were kind of articulating, Aisha, I think, and I think this is how I understand it, is I think that the, the discourse of racelessness is a kind of response to the demands that black and African descended people are making upon the state. That this is a, this is the way they are accommodated. Um, and there's a kind of a trade off, I guess, that there is a patience that is apparent in the African descended population of Cuba, which is still waiting for that thing, their rightful share, as Arlene Held put it. They, they are patiently still waiting for, for, for this uh, imagined non racist, let's, let's say race less, not race less, but non racist state. To come into being and they are seeing this project as incomplete unsatisfactory but they're going to stick with it because the alternative is is something that is worse and this state does express itself in an anti-racist manner as in the support that is sent to haiti the support that went to south africa you know the the struggle anti-colonial struggle in in black africa in the 80s I mean, there are manifestations of a very much more progressive kind of uh, uh, national project than 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 is implied by this critique of racelessness that, that which I, I don't disagree with that we've we've did. I don't know what you what you think to that. Can can I uh, can I make a, a small comment, which is that I think well, two comments, I think. Number one, I think racelessness is not the only political agenda item that I think Cubans of African descent are paying attention to. I think when we think about the revolution, think about what all the revolution promised. The revolution doesn't really even initially talk about race. They're talking really more about economic um, inequality. And Economic inequality, um, if we're, you know, creating programs to address economic inequality, that will benefit the most impoverished people, which, because of the legacies of slavery and racist colonialism, happen to be people of African descent. And that's what happened. And I think, we, to, to go to my second point, I don't think that it's reasonable to assume that people of African descent at any point in history are actually believing wholesale that what you know their their compatriots in arms are saying that we're going to build this racist republic and you know we're all going to be brothers and everything is going to be just you know beautiful. I I I can't imagine that they're actually believing that this is going to be true. Like they may be thinking oh, well, this is, you know, I can use this political discourse. I can make claims on this, you know, basis. But do they really think that from one day to night is going to be solving centuries of slavery and racist oppression? I don't, I don't think we can really pretend that they're that naive. And so I think that they realize that it's, you know, maybe a potential tool 
that they can use to, to make claims to kinds of maybe rights and authority or kind of positions or whatever else that they may want while still recognizing that it comes with other challenges, um, some of which they know, some of which they are yet to find out um, in their lives and, and that the struggle is ongoing, right? Um, I don't know, maybe that's a cynical view of it. No, it's realistic and pragmatic. <laughs> I'm just wondering yeah. if there are anybody on, on the call I, that wants to ask a question. I just wanted to say really quickly that I, I just, I would really agree with that assessment and, um, and without trying to speak for <laughs> Black Cubans, um, um, you know, I would never presume to be able to do that, but I think that, um, some of the recent work that has been done again by folks like Benson, right, has really illuminated um, what Bonnie is talking about, which is this idea of um, of really grappling with the political possibilities that are at their disposal, right, and really. Um, recognizing, like being very clear and very savvy and very cognizant, right, of the um, the gaps, the pitfalls, right, and the fundamental ways in which race still structures Cuban governance and, you know, their everyday lives, right. Um, and, you know, at the same time, and kind of recognizing, particularly in the aftermath of the revolution, right, sort of this, um, rejecting this 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 false divide um right between sort of like um these this kind of very you know narrow embrace of blackness and then and then sort of the implication that um in order to fully participate in the new nation in the revolutionary state right then you would have to discard that blackness right so i think people um have you know going back to the 19th century have been um, are just very, have been and remain um, very clear and very cognizant and very savvy about race, right? And whiteness and what it's capable of and what the nation um, has not been able to provide, right? Um, there's a historical memory there, right? There's an institutional memory there. There's, you know, people have their lived experiences. So anyway, Bonnie really kind of touched on a lot of this already, but I just wanted to underscore that. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anyone on the call that wants to ask a question? Don't be shy. No, well, um, I, 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 I've got to say, I, f I found it to be um, a really fascinating and very useful conversation for me. Stephen, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, or of course. To direct to one of the questions that we had kind of talked about, could we talk um, um, just really explicitly about gender and sexuality and just sort of um, thoughts about how that's kind of shaping this larger conversation? Absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I I want to, Cecile, did you want to speak to this? I, I want to make sure that your voice is amplified here. <laughs> no, thank you. No, you can you can start. Um, well, so one of the the questions that um for everyone watching, right, that, that Stephen had asked us to um, to think about and that Bonnie specifically, right, had asked us to think about, right, was um, just being really attentive to the ways in which um, discourses of gender and sexuality really shape the larger conversation that we're having about kind of the, um, the emergence of, um, you know, ideas around Cuban independence, you know, et cetera. And I think that, um, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to say is that um, 
so when we when we center women as historical actors, right, when we think about questions of gender and sexuality, um, it gives us a different way to think about what constitutes a movement for independence, what constitutes an anti-colonial struggle, what constitutes a movement of nation building, right? And Bonnie kind of touched on this in some of her opening remarks. Um, and I just wanted to really kind of um, hone in on the, the kind of social and immaterial and reproductive labor, right? Um, of black human women in particular that necessarily um, was an integral part of this kind of long struggle for independence, but then um, all that gender labor really becomes invisibilized when we think about when when histories get written of national political movements, right? And there's so this um, uh, um, incredible amount of um, our attention recently, I should say, has been paid paid to Mariana Rojas, for example, Mariana Rojas, right, the mother of Antonio Antonio Maceo. Um, and and people really become enamored, kind of with the with the stories of her bravery and how you know she accompanied rebel troops and kind of urged her sons in into battle. Um, and one of the things that gets you know much less frequently highlighted is the kind of daily, thankless, consistent care labor that she performed, right? Taking care of the sick and dying, and working provision grounds, and all of these kinds of things. And moreover the ways in which she was critical to shaping the racial consciousness and the political awareness of Maceo and her other children, right? Who then became central figures in the war for independence. So kind of um, thinking about, um, these are just a few examples, right? Of the ways in which centering gender as an analytic kind of requires us to think in very different terms about the emergence of the nation, right? Thinking about what constitutes an anti-colonial geography, right? Um, thinking about the kitchen, right? The patio <laughs> as a site where political work takes place, right? Thinking about the reproductive labor of enslaved women, right? As, um, as central to, you know, kind of this making of the new nation, right? Sort of like all the ways in which, you know, enslaved people of all genders and their illicit desires, right? Stories of queer life get um, invisibilized. Um, in these narratives. So I just wanted to, to kind of explicitly speak to that question a little bit because I think it's so important. Yeah. Yeah, and to your points, I, oh, sorry, Bunny. Go ahead, Bunny. <laughs> Please, after you. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was just going to say, as you were talking, Aisha, I'm thinking specifically of the um, space of religious spaces. I'm thinking of Afro-syncretic religious, the roles that women play, you know, whether to bring um, to bring herbs during the, the ceremony and how that that um, really helped the enslaved. And I'm thinking even more once. I mean, it's fairly recently, you know, my knowledge is focused on Haiti and other French-speaking islands that we start thinking about the place of women in helping runaway um, enslaved people and the Maroon community. So yeah, that's what I wanted to, I was thinking about. Yeah, I'd like to add two things. Um, number one is I, I think um, to think about um, kind of how considering, you know, gender and sexuality structurally impacts kind of how we understand um, anti-colonial struggle. I want to point out that it's maybe no coincidence that um, anti-slavery and anti-colonial struggle coincide at precisely the moment that the slave trade to Cuba is ending. Um, the last, the last uh, recorded slave voyage to enter Cuban shores was 1867. So this is literally months before the, the uprising um, in 1868 in October. Um, and that's not a coincidence, right? It's not a coincidence that, um, you know, the realization that they couldn't get any more um, African um, captives imported into the island. Um, and they had to come to terms with what they had been struggling with for over a century was the fact that they could not get enslaved women to do what they wanted them to do, which was reproduce slavery on the island. 
Um, and that realization that they could not have a self-sustaining slave population specifically because they could not control in these specific ways enslaved women, um, this is kind of really what contributed to many slave owners saying, well, okay, I guess slavery is kind of over for us. We don't really have, even though it lasted a couple more decades after that, right? It was really falling apart, especially in the Eastern provinces where there was less investment from, from the United States and other places, right? And so that piece of kind of recognizing you know, the role of women, enslaved women in particular, and their reproduction, their their bodily autonomy, kind of the ways they um, kind of staked out a claim for, you know, their own lives and their families um, really impacted the course of Cuban history, um, Cuban independence and Cuban um, abolition. And the second point that I want to make is that, um, in a lot of ways, I found in my research on um, the final war of independence, I found that women were kind of, um, oh, I don't want to say it like this, but they, they were very instrumental to um, men's negotiations vis-a-vis -vis other Cuban men. So I'm thinking specifically of something that both I and Ara Ferrer wrote about, which is the case of Quincy Mandera. Um, who was accused of mahaseria or being, you know, a lazy, bad Cuban soldier because he was alleged to have a lover in, um, in battle. And it's really interesting to, to think about these allegations about having a lover because this was literally the practice of every white Cuban officer like ever. This was like what they did. You know, this is what officer status got you. It got you access to women, in addition to access to better food and things like that. But the fact that it was so wildly unacceptable for a, a dark skinned black man to claim the same privileges as many white officers um, kind of enjoyed on a regular basis with nobody even batting an eye is real. I mean, that that really underscores kind of these, the intersections of race and gender and just how pivotal, not only women, but also attitudes about sexuality, hypersexuality, the racialized hypersexuality that we often find is ascribed to people of African descent and um, specifically about, you know, um, racialized attitudes of masculinity. Um, and so we also see it in a lot of other iterations involving women, like um, how we frame um, donations, right? So um, there was groups of Cuban women, you know, working, um, on manufacturing clothing and, and other supplies and provisions and gathering donations for the Cuban troops. And who got access to those donations? Not necessarily the people that needed them most, but the people who were perceived to need these status bumps that would align their appearance with their social status, their pre-war social status. And so a lot of these, the clothing that was manufactured by these donation groups went to prominent white officers and they weren't labeled as charity. They weren't, they were labeled as, these were provisions, right? But if there was ever any provisions that went to black officers, say Jose Gonzalez Planas, who complained repeatedly and repeatedly about being denied basic supplies for his troops, it was said that he was whining, he was complaining, he was just wanting charity, he was just wanting things that he didn't need, right? So the framings that we have of these things um, kind of um, emphasizing and accentuating the masculinity of prominent white officers while denigrating um, black officers for literally the same behavior. So I'll just end there. Terrific. Thank you. Um, it's now, uh, well, back here in England, it's 1020. So uh, <laughs> I um, I don't know uh, whether we uh, we have any questions from those that are listening in. Some people are already leaving, so maybe it's time to to wrap it up. Um, Marta, what do you say? 
I, I, I found this to be terrifically a rewarding conversation. And, uh, you know, from, from my part, I want to thank uh, Aisha, Bonnie and Cecile for their help and Lassa for making it possible to, to do this. Uh, there will be a recording and it will be on the uh, International Institute for the Study of Cuba's um, uh, YouTube site tomorrow. Um, and I will forward one to uh, all parties in this conversation and uh, Lassa will be able probably be able to make one available through its its system as well. Martha, do you want to say, say anything? Uh, I want to express a deep note of gratitude to our panelists. Really a, just a wonderfully rich discussion. Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation. It's been fabulous. And thanks to Steve for putting it all together because it really was he pulling the heavy lifting. Thank you, guys. So uh, with that, um, I guess we'll say goodbye. Um, and hopefully we'll meet in, in a few uh, months time, uh, either virtually or together in San Francisco at the Lassa, at the Lassa Congress. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bonnie. Oh my God, hi. I was like, I was listening to you. I don't know if we're still recording. Have we stopped recording? No, I stopped.